And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. The man, a man behind, so a man behind many, many greats. A man who has been doing this for as long as I've been alive, and a man who is now bringing back one of the most influential narrativist-style approaches with Everway in celebration of its silver anniversary. The man of the hour, the man with the power, the one and only Jonathan Tweet. How are you doing today, man? You know, uh, considering that it's a pandemic and it's the middle of winter in Illinois, um, I'm doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. How are you? I am. Do I am doing good. Everybody looks at all, at all that snow and look and sees stuff they got to shovel. I look at it and I say, hey, free ammo. <laughs> Makes me appreciate living in Seattle, that's for sure. <laughs> well, it's... In in that's in that sort of case, it's it's, an, it's more of a thing of you're trading one you're trading one kind of horrible weather for another. So it's either covered in snow or okay. covered in rain. It's true. Um, my mentor would put it. My mentor would put in the phrase of, "Would you rather get crapped on by a pigeon or a blue jay?" Tough choice. Yeah, but a bit now. Before I get before I get into Everway, I do have to answer a bit of a tradition that I have around here, oh, aside yeah. from the drinking, okay. and that is the humble beginnings. Oh, now, I realize this might this might be reaching this might be reaching a bit, but yeah, what talk to me about your first introduction to role playing games? Oh yeah, fantastic. So, um. I, I'm in Rock Island, Illinois right now, uh, mm -hmm. staying with my mom while she goes through chemo. And this is where I grew up, uh, mm -hmm. right next to Augustana College, where my late father was an uh, English professor. And uh, for some reason, uh, this area was an early hotbed of uh, role-playing games. Um, and maybe it's proximity to uh, Wisconsin, I don't know. So in uh, 1977, uh, when I was 12, my dad uh, brought me over one Saturday to uh, Augustana College, where the uh, the big kids were playing a new cool game that uh, my dad was sure that I would like. And sure enough, I went into a conference room in the student union, student center, mm -hmm. and there were a bunch of college students. I think they were actually playing Tecamel. Mm -hmm. Um but they, you know, showed me uh, maps on graph paper. Oh, that was cool. And they showed me uh, like a pile of uh, plastic monsters on their sides that mm -hmm. uh, the party had just killed off. Mm -hmm. And well, I was sold. Right. You give me a game where you kill monsters and uh, do uh, graph paper maps of mysterious places. And I was sold like in 1977. You couldn't. Like, you couldn't play a video game and fight dragons, right? Like, you mm -hmm. had to do it in your imagination. So this was all new. Um, and this was before the the game really um, became a mass market uh, phenomenon. Yeah. And so I got in uh, really early. Mm -hmm. I got the basic set, the Holmes basic set uh, the, for Christmas that year. And the rest is history. Yeah. Um it is it is funny you meant it is funny you made the um, video game remark because yeah. um like you said this was seven you said this was seventy seven seventy seven um it was two two years before that there technically was a D and D video game if you really want to stretch the technical part of it um there was the D and D um all lo all lowercase on play doh oh okay yeah oh. Well. Which, I certainly had never seen it. Neither had my friends. So. Most people, most people wouldn't because because um, Plato was very was very very bleeding edge. Um, it was okay. mostly it was mostly seen in in um universities. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we played a bunch of uh, Star Trek on the uh, uh, com the college computers, mm -hmm. like dialed into the mainframe and all. Yep. Um, 
you know, printed on the screen in ASCII characters, mm -hmm. right? Like, and you would move your little enterprise around and fire photon torpedoes at Klingons and stuff. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but all slow turn based, um, action, but whatever, like, it was better than anything else we could play. So, uh, anyway, yeah, D and D was, uh, uh, a godsend, you know, you live in the Midwest. There's not a lot to do. <laughs> a lot of free time. Mm -hmm. And so that was my start. Yeah. And, um, now obviously you've had, you've had your hand in a lot, a lot of games, a lot of games over the, over the years, whether it be Talos Lanta over the edge. A lot of games. Ars, Ars Magica, yeah. um, 13th yeah. Age, um, yeah. Dream, um, Dream Blade, which I think oh, I still Oh, you've been doing got. your research. Um, yeah. I, um, I'm not sure how often you were in yeah, Minnesota, but I lived and died on Shinders growing up. Like that oh, was, yeah. Oh, that was sure. the place I went to every, sing every single day. <laughs> I was going to Shinders, yep. and I was going to every bookstore within a three-mile radius. Yeah. Uh, and... Yeah, yeah, no, I, I was in uh, in Minnesota for a couple of years, first mm -hmm. for college, and then um, launching the our first, you know, game publishing business, Lion Rampant, publishing Ars Magica, yeah, and Whimsy Cards. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, so, yeah. um, I cr I I created Dr I created Dreamblade with being the with being the particular gateway drug that got me into the idea of um war into the idea of wargaming, and I've always preferred skirmish war games ever okay. since. Yeah, good. good. Yeah, no, it's, it's got some stuff to recommend it, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a neat little game. Yeah. Um, and, of and, of course, I've, um, anytime I get the chance to speak glowingly about, about say, um, Ars, Ars Magica or Talos Lanter or 13th Age, I have, I've always taken those chances. Good, yeah, yeah. Tell us, Lana turned out to be a lot of fun once I started uh, playing it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, well, for for me, it, for me, looking at something like Talos Lanta was refreshing because I um I was at a, I was at a point at that time where I was just so completely done with the Tolkien esque approach to fantasy. Yeah. No, no disrespect to Tolkien or, I mean, or the like, but yeah, it's like, but I think, yeah. When that's it's the, overdone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's over. It was overdone, and I, I always resented the idea that that's what I had to do because fantasy. Yeah. Like I, rem I remember, um, I remember going on forums and look and looking at people remarking that Planescape was too weird to be considered fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> Man's like, well, yeah. Have you seen Talos Lanta? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then some. Then somebody recommended Talos Lanta to me, and I just went down a rabbit hole. I mean, that's the thing about a role-playing game is you can make up whatever you want. You can invent whatever you want, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. But that brings me to Everway, which um, I en I I ended up trying out a couple times. Yep. But I but it but it but I never had it. And the one time I tr the one time I tried to get it, all that I ended up getting was the was the Sphere Walkers handbook because yep. the seller on eBay decided to screw me over. Okay. Well. <laughs> so I so it's like I have I have a game that revolves around the revolves around a tarot deck without yep. the actual deck. <laughs> well, luckily there's a Kickstarter mm -hmm. right now yep. for Everway, as you well know, mm -hmm. and you can get. Uh, a deluxe version of the fortune deck, right? Mm -hmm. Never before seen. Woo! Uh, <laughs> better than uh, better than the version we had in '95. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, like where they, the fans who put this version together uh, learned some things and did some things right. So, yep. yeah. So everybody's coming back, and now everyone who wants in can get in. Yeah. Which I want to talk a bit about the origins of, of the project. How you did? Bet. How did Everway get started as as an idea? Since it's yeah. ve it was every re every review I had read of it at the time talked about how completely out, completely outside the norm it was, and um, I'd argue still is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, some might accuse me of being outside the norm, uh, but um, so I did another game that was outside the norm called Over the Edge, mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
it was set up so that you could kind of create whatever character that you wanted. And so in order to accomplish that, it was set in uh, sort of a alternative reality version of Earth, kind of where the weekly world news is true. Mm -hmm. um, and so that meant that you didn't have to, like, like for Tell Atlanta, you have to sort of know what the setting is before you can create your character. Mm -hmm. And with Over the Edge, you know what the setting is. It's it's this world, only weirder, and so you can make up whatever you want. Yeah. Well, some people, I think especially beginner gamers, find that daunting. Like for me, it's like, wow, I can do whatever I want. That's cool. And mm -hmm. for some, it's like, well, if you don't give me choices, I don't know if I'm doing it right. And so that was my experience with Over the Edge, that, that there were plenty of people who wanted more guidance in creating characters, but I still wanted people to be able to do whatever they wanted. And so my solution to that was to use imagery and um, have characters. Uh, so uh, look at, uh, be, have their characters based on cards, mm -hmm. on images and cards. So um, the new game has all the images right in the book. So you don't even need the separate card set. Um, but the, all, the cards are also available because uh, cards are cool. Mm -hmm. And the I idea is you just look through a bunch of cards and find ones that you like, and then you create your character based on that. So this is kind of an ambiguous image of some kind of moon rose. Well, you know, is that moon rose your fairy mother? Is that moon rose the vision that your character sees and is pursuing across the world? Or... You know, what is that the the black lotus that you ate in order to, to transform into the sorcerer that you are today? Well, you get to make that up. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way that for Over the Edge, the setting is the modern day, so you can make up whatever you want. In Over the Edge, the setting is sort of traveling around the worlds from one sphere to another and all these different realms. So whatever you make up, well, that's true somewhere on some world. So if you're from the ice world and your uh, uh, other character is, is from the jungle world or whatever, you you're, it's all about traveling from world to world. So mm -hmm. you can create an uh, ice character and the other guy creates a jungle character and then you're fast friends and you go travel to these other realms. Mm -hmm. And so the idea was just what would it take to get people creating characters that, that really are their creation? And, and that's what the... Uh, images are for and that's what uh, that's how that all came out and then once once you have got that game once you got that concept then for me it was pretty easy uh, to also say well we're going to use cards for uh, the conflict resolution uh, or story generation mm -hmm. um, mechanics so that instead of rolling dice for what happens you draw these tarot like cards that all have different meanings and maybe they're connected to planets or they're connected to deities they're connected to elements or parts of the self or whatever and and um you can use that not only for finding out how a battle goes but also you take a left turn that the game master didn't prepare for and you go off uh someplace that that there's nothing set uh, up yet the game master can draw a couple cards mm -hmm. and that's your wandering event uh, deck or your uh, random plot deck. And again, people feel like the cards are telling them what's happening, but really it's all coming out of your unconscious, right? And yeah. so when, when people look at, at this card and they feel like, oh, that card is telling me something about my character's past. Well, no, you are making up something about your character's past. And that mm -hmm. card is just kind of the, the, you know, it's kind of the stone in the stone soup that gets you uh, to bring out your own imagination. And so that's, I mean, that's why I do role-playing games is mm -hmm. because they encourage people to be imaginative and to be creative. And we live in this highly corporated, I mean, corporate society where every corporation wants to colonize your brain with its memes uh, and its characters. And they want you to care about its people that aren't real rather than some other corporations, people that aren't real. Um, and role playing is one of the few places where people are creative and make up their own stuff and share it with their friends. And I, I maybe it's dorky. I think that's beautiful. For for me, the um, 
for what it's worth, I will I will note that I can sh definitely share that sentiment, and I've I've mentioned the I've mentioned in the past that the reason I end up the reason I stick with role playing games as much as I do is it is it is a it is the it is the one kind of create the one kind of creative endeavor that anyone can venture into that has the lowest relative barrier to entry compared to uh, compared sure. to other things yeah and, and it, it makes you a creator right off mm -hmm. the bat yeah yeah and that and it's also the reason I end up using the term um, the term sa the term sandbox or as my mentor would put it box of yep. Legos because yep. that's literally that's what right. the um, rule set is and yep. and it's why you've got stuff like rule zero Rule zero. Yeah. Um, Sometimes I call it it's like a, it's like a tea party, <laughs> right? Right. Where you set up your little stuffed animals and you have a tea party mm -hmm. or whatever. I mean, it's yeah. It's just you're making up social situations and it's a story and yeah. yeah. Would that make you the Mad Hatter in this situation? <sighs> yeah, maybe so. That's right. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now. One of the things I was curious about when it came to the design of the of the fortune deck was the yeah. choice of um, the choice of characters and the choice of themes. Since while there's definitely some in well, when I look at the fortune deck, there's definitely some influences from the uh, major arcana in ter in the tarot. Obviously, there's be there's been some additions, and with the early incarnation of it before. It became the ever way that we know that we know. Yeah. What were you using the standard um, tarot deck? Yeah, we, that's that's how it started, mm -hmm. right? Is, is uh, that we, we, you know that's what was available, and mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I I think I already had a tarot deck, and so it was easy to use, and people understood it, and um, and then one of the things we did once I got to Wizards was we invented our, our own version with its own kind of pattern. Yeah. And it kind of fell into place in an interesting way. We, we you know, um, and so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with it. When we launched it, we didn't tell anyone about kind of the, the hidden pattern in it. Um, and now, well, now we're telling everybody mm -hmm. uh, because it's cooler to know things than to not know things, right? So there's a there's a duality, um, two cards that are uh, uh, kind of yin and yang, and so one's fire and air, and the other's earth and water, and then um, there's kind of a um, a tripartite set, three cards that represent the three parts of the self: mm -hmm. the soul, the body, and the mind. Right. And then for four, I really love the seasons. Um, I've used those like in Ars Magica, I used the seasons uh, as a, sort of a metaphor for um, the home base that the wizards are from. Is it a spring covenant where it's like they're just starting out and everything's great? Or is it an autumn covenant? And, you know, it's it's a harvest time. So they're wealthy, but like the cold is setting in and they're mm -hmm. kind of becoming corrupt or decadent or. And so uh, I did that for uh, every way right there, four seasons, mm -hmm. and each one of those is related to uh, an element. I really like uh, summer. That's the best card, I think, the best looking card. Um, and then we just, um, my friend Greg Stolze uh, suggested a card something like the sailor drowns in his armor. And I was like, wow, that actually sounds really cool. And so I, we did a series of uh, five cards that are, they're all, um, fallacies or failures right mm -hmm. and so drowning in armor is when your defensive tactics turn deadly for yourself mm -hmm. right the, the the thing that's supposed to protect you actually kills you right i love yeah. irony um so then we had that like the six fantastic beasts mm -hmm. uh and those are each of those are related to two elements Right, and you've got yeah. four elements, and then you've got six combinations of two elements, and so you know the cockatrice and the dragon, and all these things that are um, all, all have sort of a mythic resonance, mm -hmm. uh, and so that that was cool for seven. Naturally, it's the the seven planets, yeah. right? Uh, the seven astrological planets. I did a lot of research on like um, 
uh, astrology for, um, you know, just game writing that I had been doing. Uh, and so I, I was able to draw on all that and then uh, eight deities. And then each one of these uh, mm -hmm. deities um, it either represents one or two elements. And so there's there's all these underlying patterns. And, and then there's a, uh, a usurper card, which is kind of the the unknown power, right, that comes in and uh, it's, it's a loan card. And the idea is the whole universe is kind of out of whack because the 36 things that are supposed to unify it, there's only 35 of them and there's one missing. And that one missing element is a void that gets filled and every different realm you go into has a different sort of spiritual force that is the usurper in that realm. So like, Every, every realm has the force of law, uh, although it might be law upside down, which is disorder instead mm -hmm. of order. Um, and every realm has a usurper, but it's a different usurper each time. And that mm -hmm. tells you something about what the uh, what that realm is, what that, that land. Yeah. So, yeah, the fortune deck... Um, turned into something really great. I'm really glad in, a, in retrospect that we didn't go with the tarot cards because it really let us do something our way that was our own thing and that was you know more fantastical and and um and then of course you can meet literally dragons and cockatrices and satyrs in the world and those are also part of the deck and those so those have kind of a mythic or elemental uh resonance rather mm -hmm. you know instead of just being a seven hit die monster with three attacks or whatever yeah um, and the more I think, of, the more I think about it, the um, the framework, the framework of the tarot definitely makes sense, especially given the lesser arcana um, yep. focus are are focused so much on the four elements, which is one, which is one of the key factors with character creation, the yep. four um, Hellenistic elements of earth, air, fire, and water. That's right. And yep. given given that. Something that I'm something that I'm curious about is when it when it came when it came to when it came to uh, describing the domains of what each of the four elements would um, do. Yeah. Was were there were there any were there any parts during development that were a bit tricky to get to get across to um to players? So from what I've heard, no. Like I mean, I think the. Uh the we're, we're sort of steeped in the Aristotelian mm -hmm. elements, even if people haven't read up on astrology. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and again, this all goes back to your character as well, where instead of having a strength score and an intelligence score, you've got a fire score and that represents sort of how energetic you are. And you can use that for combat, but use that for all sorts of things that require physical energy. Yeah. And air is your like mental ability, your analytical ability. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, water is your sensitivity and earth is your durability. And so those things all get like reinforced mm -hmm. at the at the character level. And then if you're trying to do something fiery, like you're you're trying to win a battle or something like that, and you draw a card that it's a fire card, well, that's going to have a big effect. If it's an upright mm -hmm. positive card, that's great. And if it's upside down, that's very not great. And so, um, yeah, from, from what I've heard, I think, uh, uh, people get it. Mm -hmm. It, it, you know, it's, it all, it all feeds into itself and all becomes a sort of a coherent whole. Yeah. And, and then for, mm -hmm. one thing I want to say for the, mm -hmm. that the new game has, uh, that the Everway company has done is just in the same way that the tarot has the major arcana and the minor arcana. So, the original fortune deck we did that I just went through sort of step by step, mm -hmm. that's basically the major arcana. It's 36 cards and they're all, you know, their own thing. But then they went through and they did the season deck. And so this is more like a regular, uh, you know, it's it's kind of four suits, right? The four mm -hmm. seasons and they're uh, numbered like cards in a regular deck. And then they reuse all that really cool art that's from the... Um, from the vision cards mm -hmm. and there's so much great art in the game and they're making way better use of it than I did uh, 25 years ago. 
And so, um, so now they have a deluxe fortune deck that in addition to the 36 cards that I designed, there's a whole set of these uh, season cards that uh, let you do more with the deck or mm -hmm. play games with it or, yeah. So really, really happy with what those guys have done. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, this, the site has been lost to time, but I do remember seeing someone try and convert Everway into into certain um, already yep. existing campaign settings. One of the yep. big one of the big ones was um, someone trying to convert it to Glorantha. The, oh, interesting. The, yep. The, um, the yeah, the, the yeah. setting for RuneQuest. Yeah. Um, oh, I love Glorantha. I'm a big old Glorantha fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and. In a, and in a way that that would it would certainly make sense to now gr now granted from what I was able to recover from the site which take I take with a grain of salt because I was basically using a some I was basically using like a third generation save of it um, okay. it didn't do exactly what what I would have done personally I probably would have if I was running a everway Glorantha I probably would have created a whole new um, fortune deck based solely on the runes. That's probably what I would do too. Yeah, that's right. You got me thinking. Mm -hmm. So I've played Glorantha using the RuneQuest rules. I've used them playing with Robin Laws's Hero Quest rules, now mm -hmm. called the Quest World rules. Yeah. Uh, I, I, Rob Hainsaw and I did 13th Age Glorantha, so it's the mm -hmm. 13th Age rules, which are basically D20 but ramped, you know, amped up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I did a little home campaign using the Over the Edge rules for Glorantha. So. Yeah, now you got me thinking. Maybe I'll have to do uh, Everway Glorantha too, just to just to keep going on that uh, yeah. uh, on that series. Um, but the and get and given how and um, I get the feeling that the whole the whole concept of spheres that you had set up was part of was part of that notion of a lot giving people a means to create literally any sort of character that they wanted. That's right. I wanted mm -hmm. people to be able to look at the cards and come up with an idea for their character and not have to sort of play this mother may I game where it's like, well, are, are these kinds of characters available in this campaign or are all these kinds of characters in this campaign considered like outcasts and so it won't be any fun to play this kind of character or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, no, yeah, you could just you can make up what you want. Yeah. And yeah, that's right. And then the same goes for game masters, right? So when we were play testing every way, like one person after another would take their turn being game master, and then they could just create a, their realm, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I want a realm where, you know, wh whatever, uh, it's it's talking animals, or there are no animals, and uh, you know, and and all all burdens have to be borne by humans, or whatever, yeah. and and you can make up that kind of twilight zone or star trek world that you go and visit this weird place and you don't have to worry about where it exists on the campaign map because you're traveling from sphere to sphere from world to world i um i will i will admit that the times i've done um multiverse style approaches there's one unwritten rule that i t that i tend to use and i i will blatantly admit that the best way it was explained was in um Cook and Cordell's project, The Strange, and oh, that yeah. is okay. that is translating. That being when when you go to when you go to a different sphere, your your appearance and sometimes your abilities are going to change because you're it, because you're not traveling yep. between worlds, you're translating between them. Yep. So the world is going to put is going to create some sort of some sort of appearance and the like so that you fit. You don't stick out like a sore thumb in the place. Yep. So the, and that uh, uh, there are some everyday players who uh, played it that way and um, uh, yeah and that, that was uh, was Nexus the Infinite City was like that so that was mm -hmm. like before Feng Shui the game that mm -hmm. um, uh, that people don't remember but yeah it had exactly that thing where you you translate to a, a local yeah. uh, version of yourself uh, you know like a, a like locally approved or locally. Whatever. Like in Star Trek, mm -hmm. whatever, everywhere they go, it just happens to be white people, and Spock just has to put his cap on his ears and he fits in. But obviously, with every way, it's all over the map, right? Mm -hmm. Like you go all sorts of weird places. Yeah, yeah. The now, given given that, um, something I'm curious about because this is the, 
I would definitely say from it, from all my research, that a game like Everway is a queue-based system instead instead of a re instead of a randomizer-based system. I mean, yeah. In what I mean, what I mean by that is there a common trap I've I've seen is when people refer to certain um, card-based games as as diceless. Right. When I my definition of a diceless game is one that has no that has absolutely no like tr no randomizer. Right. Like that that was yeah that was an important part of Amber is that there's no randomizer. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, uh, and an important part of Everway is oh yeah there's a randomizer. It's not, but it's more than a randomizer. Yeah. Right? It's a it's a symbol generator or a queue generator. It's not random. It's it's not a random number. It's a random queue. Yeah, right, a random element for you to riff off of. Um, I do remember. I do remember a friend. I do remember a friend of mine describing it as the, as the gate as the game equivalent of a Mad Lib, which. Oh yeah! <laughs> oh yeah! Well, yeah. I'm not sure if I'd go. I'm not sure if I'd go that far because there's not the blind check, but. Yeah. Not too far no, the, off. The, the, the important thing, mm. the thing about a Mad Lib is that you have nothing to go on. Yeah. And the important thing about Everway is you have enough to go on mm -hmm. that you don't even realize how creative you are being. Yeah, yeah. But given given that, I'm cu I'm curious on the role of the of the element the um, values of each element when it comes to a a character and what that would represent in relation to the fortune deck. Because right. a lot of people are going to have the are always going to have the assumption that you want. Um, that you use that as a basis for some for some sort of randomizer, and that's obviously not the case with Everway's design. Right, right. I mean, it's a little bit of a randomizer because you're going to get good cards mm -hmm. and bad cards, mm -hmm. right? So if you're doing an intellectual task and that requires your um, your air score, then mm -hmm. the game master figures out, well, what's your air score? Are you above average? Average? How far above average? Is this one of your specialties and that gives you a bonus? And then sort of figures out how difficult this conflict is going to be for you. What, what are the likely results, good and bad? And then with that in mind, you, you draw a card and like, if it's a, a positive upright air card, that's really, really good. Mm -hmm. If it's a, you know, a water card or an earth card that, you know, it might be good or bad. It's more like a middling result. Uh, and if it's a, a upside down, air card so it's like negative then that's going to be bad and so mm -hmm. there's a little bit of uh you know there's a little bit of randomizer in there mm -hmm. um but mostly like you said it's a cue right like you get you get the um disorder card well what is you know that's not just things went bad but things went bad in some interesting disorderly way yeah yeah and the other the other thing I'm the other thing I'm curious about with this is the relationship between powers and magic. Yep. Now, given how freeform a game like this is, something I'm curious about is where do you draw the line between what would be considered a power and what would be considered a magic? Yeah, that's a uh, you got a really specific question there and mm -hmm. that's a good one. So, the um the general rule is that uh, powers represent kind of all sorts of things that you might be able to do, whether it's talking to animals, right, or um, you know, uh, uh, altering your, uh, your your physical form or taking on a different shape or something like that. And then and then magic is kind of the a studied approach to the supernatural. So it's your it's your ability to understand and manipulate the supernatural on a um, not not necessarily theoretical level. It might be an intuitive level, but it is um, it is your ability to I interact with the the supernatural on a um, a more abstract level. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want to like uh, break a curse or even discern what kind of curse is on somebody or whatever, um, then you know, your ability to turn into a were tiger is not going to help you. It's a power. It's, it does a specific thing. Mm -hmm. But um, but if you have some sort of 
transformation magic, you might be able to understand how this curse transforms or can be transformed. And then you have a sort of this abstract ability to, to uh, interact with the supernatural. It's much more, um, it's more flexible because it's more like applying a technique or a mm -hmm. point of view to the, uh, to the supernatural. Uh, so like uh, shamans and wizards and whatever mm -hmm. uh they they rather than having a specific power like i've got laser eyes or whatever right they they have a relationship to the supernatural that allows them to to approach it and interact with it the way a, a crafter or an artisan yeah does and given that given that i'm cu i'm curious how i'm curious um to give an to give an example, and this is the reason why I I brought up the whole thing of where where the line between the two would be. Um, suppose take for instance the tip the typical um fantasy monk, you know, someone who's able to achieve these yeah. um these yeah. soup these extra human feats of abilities through yeah. cu through cultivation and use of key. Um, yep. Yeah. In a system like Everway, would you would that be leaning more towards powers, magic, or would you put it, or would you put that down to player interpretation? Right. So that so the game master would have to uh, talk with the player and you know just make sure that everyone understands what's involved. If mm -hmm. it's something like you've learned all these ways to, you know, enhance your own abilities, your your speed or your endurance or your ability to hold your breath, and you 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 know. So you're sort of like the super athlete. Mm -hmm. That's more like a power. Um, but if it's sort of like you, you are the chi master, and so you could detect chi and manipulate chi and read chi and trans. You know, like you you can you can interact with the supernatural world through this power. Then then you're kind of a magician. Yeah, that's a good good question. Yeah. Hey, I got a favor. Can you mm -hmm. ask me how well the Kickstarter has done? <laughs> Yeah, I, I was about to get to that because the Kickstarter zone. Uh, I have to I have to correct myself again because it just updated as I was talking. Um, the Kickstarter's only been up for I'd, I'd say a cup I'd say a couple days at most. That's right. And two days. Yep. Yeah, two days. You're shooting for thirty thousand, and it's and it's just over forty eight just over forty eight thousand in right. the span of forty eight hours, and you've still Yay. got twenty nine okay. days to nice. go. Now, now I can crack my beer in celebration. So that's right. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, we we, uh, we funded in four hours, and uh, it, yeah, we're doing great. It's really exciting. Yeah. Um. Now, when it when it comes to the sh when it comes when it comes to the whole thing with magic, going up going a bit further into that. Yeah. Um. With. Was it was it also your was it also your intent from the get go to have magic be freeform so that players would have to discern the magic system itself instead of um, instead of just going with a oh it just happens approach? Yeah, that, and and in fact, that's one of the areas where the new version is a, a stronger than the original. Like, um, it's it's already hard to do a game where you say you can create whatever kind of character you want mm -hmm. and then it's harder to do a game where it's like you can also create whatever kind of magician you want well now what does that mean right like it's it, we we have some idea of what mighty warriors are like or mm -hmm. super smart people are like or super intuitive people are like but we don't have any shared knowledge of what magicians are like and so it's it's that's why for a lot of fantasy games the magic system is the the biggest chunky new mechanic that's that is different from any other mm -hmm. system because you're modeling something really differently right yeah. so you know you could you you could roll attack rolls in rune quest and D, and you could hit and you could miss and you could re do damage and you could kill the guy or not kill the guy it's like you're kind of doing the same thing you're simulating swinging a sword at a guy mm-hmm but the magic system were totally different because there's no real world magic system for people to simulate. Yeah. And so I, I would, I'm really grateful to the Everway company for putting the work in to figure out like what do players need in order to do a better job of understanding, just reaching an understanding with the game master and everyone else. Like this is what I can do and this is what I can't. And so they uh, sort of beef that up mm -hmm. a little bit and, um, 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's it's tough. You want to give people liberty, um, but you also don't want to leave the game master hanging, unable to understand, agree with the player on what the character can do and not do. Yeah. So, yeah. And obvious, and obviously, given how given how players are, if you put if you put in so if you put in something without a downside, be prepared for that thing to get abused. <laughs> That's right. I mean, magic has a pretty big downside in that you've got to devote character points to it that otherwise would make you a lot tougher. Yeah. You know, like it's you 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 do you do pay a cost for it, and but then it's like, how do you know that you're getting the right amount of bang out of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could could easily be the reverse that someone, you know, puts four points into their magic, and that means all four of their element scores are like one lower than they could have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. And then they don't they feel like they don't get enough out of the the magic system. So yeah, it's the, magic systems tend to be the trickiest thing for you know the reasons that we just discussed, and, and I think everyone's no no different. Ideally, people who want to play some sort of magician have a an idea of what they mean by that and what they want to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Plus, if you look if you look at how magicians and, and the like are depicted in other other media, um, and since I'm a big comic book guy, I'll ju I'll just use um, Doctor Strange for example. Yeah. Um, you don't ha you don't have a spell list with the guy. You have he have cer you have certain artifacts and certain right. certain sig certain signature items, tricks, and what have you, but. Right. You're not, but trying to put in a traditional spell list would all you'd end up with a character is um, a character sheet that's big enough to be its own book. <laughs> that's right, right, and that's the idea with every way is that you you're a magician, you have a a way of approaching things and a way of doing things, but you mm -hmm. don't have a spell list, right? Just like if you're a carpenter, you've got a way of dealing with wood and whatever, but you don't you don't have a list of these are the five things I can make. Would you would you say that the um, that the limit that the limitation factor in some in something like this is is tied to one the table's interpretations and two the vision system? Well, elaborate on that question for me, and let me so I can sink my teeth in. Um, when it comes when it comes to using the vision cards to create a backstory, so that um, so that through that people have. At least an idea on the sort of magic that you're going to be doing. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's um, so like we had a guy in our Everway play test recently, right? Who used the picture of the the person who's like I don't know using telekinetic powers to mm -hmm. lift things up off the ground or whatever. And it, okay, so that helped us understand. Oh, I, I see what kind of I see what you want to get out of playing this character and and what we can expect to to see from them. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but a lot of it, you know, there's no, there's no substitute for the conversation between the game master and the player and, um, to, to sort of sort everything out, you know, and, and also like, what can't you do as well as what can you do? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of trust involved in ever way, like in, in, in D and D it's almost designed to be playable even if you don't trust the dungeon master right like you, you create your character by the rules and they can't say no and and so uh you're then your character can do whatever your characters stats allow them to do and mm -hmm. in every way it's more like you're creating this story together and we're you know you're creating something together and so you you have to you have to work together to, to make it work mm -hmm. and Speaking on that, when it comes to the notion of powers, mm -hmm. um, now obviously there's the, obviously you have it set up where there's diff where there's different um, tiers of them, whether that be whether that be minor, fre frequent, yep. major, or um, versatile. Okay. Now, frequent and ma fr fr minor, frequent, and major, I can I can infer I can infer those yeah. based on just the wording yeah. itself. Yeah. Um, where do you draw the line between what would be considered a what would be considered one of those three, or what would be considered a versatile power? Yeah. So, um, like, if you 
if you can change into a were tiger, that's super cool. Mm -hmm. It's not versatile, right? Like that's everyone knows what you're capable of doing. Mm -hmm. If you can transform into lots of different things or have some sort of open ended, whatever, then, oh, so you can use that for tricking people or for getting places or for hiding, you know, like there's lots of different kinds of problems you can solve by, by, uh, shape changing and a much smaller number of problems you can solve by being a tiger. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of the idea. Do you have a, a power that, um, you, you can, you can use in lots of different ways or do you have, you know, more like, um, and that's, and that's versatile. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I call that out specifically if, if you have a really, they've got a major power that's useful a lot, but it's a narrow power, then you can, then the game master knows what you're going to be capable of and can set up challenges that are going to challenge the whole party, even though you're capable of doing whatever. But if you're versatile, that means, oh, okay, whatever I'm going to throw at you, you're going to be able to try to use this power um, to, to try to overcome it. And so it's just more, um, uh, it, it's it's going to come into play solving more different kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. But I I mean, and then again, you know, it, it it's it's pretty free form, and so it comes down to a conversation. And it is sort of like if you're willing to spend the extra point to say yes, it's versatile. Then when you try something new with it, you can say, hey, this I paid a point for this to be a versatile power. I want to be able to use it in this new way. And if you didn't pay a point for it to be versatile and the game master says, I don't, I don't think you can use that in this new weird way. You didn't pay, you didn't pay the versatile point. So it helps the game master in, in, interpret what you can and cannot get away with. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the silver anniversary edition, now obviously yeah. it's being, obviously of, of course it's being split into two books, um, one yeah. for the player and one for the GM. Yeah. But, what what are some of what are some of the major things that the that this anniversary edition is is bringing to the table? I mean, obviously, obviously, using a more modern um, more modern production style is is one of the is one of the big things. But since you mentioned um, some adjustments when it comes to magic, I'm curious what else is get is getting added. Yeah, good question. So there's there's just there's more content. Um, you know. For for the original Everway, we we talked about you know the the six supernatural beasts that appear in the um, in the fortune deck, and then those also appear as sort of monsters or creatures that you can encounter in the world. Um, but that's pretty thin, mm -hmm. uh, and th this new version has lots of new guidelines for different kinds of creatures you can encounter, whether you're fighting them or exploring and you know studying them or allying with them or whatever and um just go goes into more detail it's more more like a regular role-playing game um in that way and I, I think that that's really uh appropriate it's going to be well well appreciated by the fans um we we did a couple things like uh you know maybe you should cap your uh element score at six instead of going up to nine if it's kind of ridiculous to have a score of nine mm -hmm. uh in something because it means all your other scores are going to be really weirdly low and you're gonna have this one score that's super high and you know i guess 25 years ago i was kind of erring on the side of letting people get away with stuff and now i'm more like i want to make sure that people don't accidentally create a character that's no fun mm -hmm. um and so or um someone's guideline stuff like that there's kind of a simple advancement system um uh, which ever we didn't have anything systematic on how you could advance like your character could get better or discover things or learn things but only you know in the narrative context of the plot or right? not mm -hmm. not sort of mechanically and so um Not a lot has changed in terms of the way the game works, but in terms of providing more support uh, for the players, like in the magic system, that, that's that's really the the big benefit. And I think mm -hmm. looking back, you know, 
I, I was sort of uh, sort of too optimistic about how well people could handle a really free form open ended system without a lot of guidance. It, you know, the, the uh, guidance really helps. There's also just more uh, sort of quest material. Like there was mm -hmm. one introductory quest in the original, and now there's several. So uh, way more stuff, all color, really beautiful, better use of the art. Mm -hmm. Mostly the same. Like, you know, the, the game holds up overall. Mm -hmm. it, it does what it needs to do. So that, that's happy to see. Yeah. In the in that regard, would you con would you consider this some um, this silver anniversary edition more of a director's cut than a new edition? That's an interesting. It's an interesting case. Um, it's way more than a cut, right? Like it's not just, uh, you know, resampling or re-editing. It it really is um, fixing things or bringing in new things. Mm -hmm. um, uh it's a you know it's an upgrade it's it's uh you know knowing what we know now here's the extra material that's going to make the game better and a yeah. format that's going to make it more appealing and easier to use mm -hmm. which i can i can definitely get i can definitely get behind that and one of the things i saw on the page when it came to the bullet point for the game master's book that um that i'm curious about is it mentions guidance on how to on how to run combat was yeah. was combat management something you got a lot of questions about back then yeah and we would get reports from uh you know players who were like felt that the uh the open ended nature was a little um uh, a little daunting mm -hmm. and so uh like like one big change is I think in general in role playing games, there's been a move toward uh, breaking the fourth wall a little and giving players information that their character doesn't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, uh, in, in the original, I said that the game master should have in their head a good idea of what can go wrong or what can go right in this conflict. And now the advice is yeah actually have that discussion with the player right like you you know you're going you're going to try this thing this is the stuff that you can imagine can go wrong and this is the stuff you can imagine go you go right so that the so that the everyone at the table then knows what the stakes are mm -hmm. and and everyone is sort of involved with the the, the draw and then um it, it all so it, it takes some of the pressure off the the game master from having to like keep all that a secret and figure everything out in their mm -hmm. head. Like if you have sort of predigested everything, like, Hey, you know, if this is a bad card, you could easily be overwhelmed by these people you're taking on and captured by your arch enemy. Right. Yeah. So but you're, you know, are you cool jumping into this battle knowing that that might happen? Um, and then if you do draw the bad card, everyone already knows what could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, and that makes things, you know, easier. You'd rather have the discussion ahead of time. Like maybe the player says, "Oh, I didn't realize there were that many people that that I'm going to try to fight at once. I'm not willing to take that risk. I don't jump into the battle." Or right. Or if they do, then everyone knows what is coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they get captured, no one can sort of complain. Whereas if it's all been in the game master's head, then when they when they pull out that bad consequence, that's when the player is going to say, I didn't think that would happen or, you know, whatever. And so a lot of it is, is how, how do you frame a free form game? I didn't have a lot of experience back then, mm -hmm. right? Like how do you, how do you frame free form conflicts so that they are rewarding? Well, yep. now everyone has more experience doing that. Mm -hmm. Hooray. And I will, I will admit one thing that one thing that I've done to kind to kind of address this sort of thing is, given how a lot of a lot of my experiences, there's always this back and forth between players and GMs asking questions about what's in about what's in the room, what what yeah. sort what sort of enemies are in are in there, that and that sort of thing. I didn't I didn't approach where for each li each little um each little detail that get that gets asked um. 
another card is drawn and placed face down. And when there's, let's ju let's just say five of them, um, I I ask them, okay, you've got you've gotten as much detail as you can. Now pick one card. And I fig I figured doing that doing that little thing would allow for a degree of of the idea that somebody's fate is as in their control to to at least a small extent. So yeah, not everything's no, riding on just one draw. Yeah, that's interesting, right? A lot of it is kind of theater like that, mm -hmm. right? Like I have the player cut the deck before uh, I uh, I draw their card or have mm -hmm. them draw the card or whatever. Like it's a, it's yeah, uh, it's a it it's exciting. I mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. like they're. A lot of role playing games where someone rolls a die and doesn't really matter how it turns out because they're going to roll a hundred dice by the end of the game session. Mm -hmm. And in every way, you don't draw a hundred cards from the deck, you, you know. And so every draw is is something special, and that's makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. And now, mm -hmm. now, now, taking all taking all of that into it's fast, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, taking all that into account, one of the other things I, I saw on the page that is definitely interesting to me is, um, the is the realm of caravan page example and the idea of realm creation. Um, is something like that is something like that going to work similarly to to character creation? Because that's that's the vibe that I'm getting from the um, from the page image. Yeah, so there, um, I would use uh, draws from the fortune deck to mm -hmm. set up like what's going on in a realm, yeah. right? Like what are the forces that are in conflict, or what what's what does the future and the past hold for this realm, and then what's the what's the thing that is yet to be resolved? What you know, and you can do it a bunch of different ways. You can do it with a single draw. Sometimes it's just like, oh, okay, you you turned left down this road. I didn't expect that. Let's find out what's happening in this new realm. Oh. It's the cockatrice. Guess what? There's a plague. Um, and and but that is really for realms where um, it's different from character creation. And character creation, it that's your that's your avatar. That's the that's that's you. Some part of you, some projection of your unconscious that you're bringing into the table and and, and interacting through. And so it's important to have control over that. Now, some people like to draw random cards and see what happens, and that's that's part of it. Mm -hmm. But re really, the the random stuff using the fortune deck to create plots or backgrounds or backstories that's mostly for non-player characters or uh, realms that people encounter. It's it's less for player characters. Mm -hmm. And. With with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind now as I'm as as mentioned, um, and I, and looks like in the, looks like in the time that I've said it earlier and the and now it's gone it's gone up a little bit further but, give but, given, the fact that you that you've gotten this far on it in only two days when you've got um twenty nine days to go and I usually ask this with everybody's um crowd funds. What is the release window that you're that you're planning for that you're at least shooting for when it comes to the digital and the physical um, versions, respectively? Yeah. So, um, so the Everway Company is the publisher, mm -hmm. uh, and they're handling the logistics. They say August for their physical, uh, the physical release, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's pretty much done. Um, and so I think you can imagine that the digital stuff is going to come sooner, but I'm not going to promise on their behalf. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if the digital stuff comes sooner than that. It's, it is pretty close to done. We might get some feedback, um, you know, based on uh, previews we're letting people see. And so maybe there'll be some changes, but um uh, I, I guess the official word is August and I'm, I'm not going to officially diverge from the, the official word. So, mm -hmm. uh, some, some stuff we just have, right? Like if you, if you, as an add on, uh, buy one of the original fortune decks, those are sitting in a 
you know, in a warehouse and, and we can just ship them to you. So some stuff could come uh, almost right away, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. And this year okay. soon. Yeah. If it, if it ends up being August, I will, even if it ends up being late August, I will, con I will consider that my birthday present for the year because that's the month of my birthday. Nice. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, it'll be by August for sure. Mm -hmm. Like we're, I mean, well, I guess who, who maybe there'll be another pandemic or something, but yeah, but you know, just just to make sure I don't um, tempt the gods of irony. <laughs> That's right. Because Lord knows, we, Lord knows, the one thing we don't need is more jinxing. That's right. That's right. But with all of that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show, and. Yeah. Uh, and enjoy the insanity that comes at, that comes here and all and those are, drinking. <laughs> yeah, those you you bet those those are some great questions. You obviously did your homework and mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, those hard softballs. So that was that was a lot of fun. I love talking about Everway. It's I'm so thrilled to see it coming back. You know, mm -hmm. it was uh, um, it was kind of a long shot when we launched. Like it's you know, is a game this unusual gonna find a market and uh maybe the answer is yes it will in 25 years mm -hmm. and so here we are yep. and yeah just, yeah and of course anytime you see fit to return to the temple the okay. door is always open as i often okay. say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged all right well yeah i've mm -hmm. i've got i've got some celebrating to do that's for sure <laughs> And of course, yeah. a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there yep. will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. See you, everyone.